Well, that is a grand beginning to our worship this morning. That was wonderful. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Why don't you stand up? We are um, a couple housekeeping things. These uh, four chandeliers, they're not going to come on in the midst of worship today, okay? So we're not sure. <clears throat> these have never, we've never had a problem with these four, uh, which are on a different breaker than the others. And so we started, uh, they went out on Thursday. We realized they were out on Thursday, so we've been starting on Thursday and Friday to try to fix it. So, so you're going to be in the dark, um, which is, you know, where many of you are comfortable in this space. Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing. And second thing is, we will have communion today, but it, you, we're using those communion kits. Uh, you should have grabbed one when you walked in. Fred, right back there, has a basket, and it, it, just raise your hand. Uh, and he will, he will give you a communion uh, kit so that you can take communion in the midst. So no problems there. And we are using, when we get to our liturgy, which will be uh, at the um, gospel acclamation, we're going to be at page 188 at the, at the beginning of your hymnal. Page 188. It isn't music that you're familiar with. It's really beautiful music. Um, and uh, we're going to do some of that uh, setting on page 188 and then some of the communion from that setting on page 190 and 191. The words will be up here, but, uh, but the music will be in that hymnal if, if you want to try to sing along with, uh, with uh, Tyler. <laughs> God, I'm in great shape this morning, aren't I? Holy cow, wait till you hear this sermon I make a mess of too. <laughs> It'll only get better. Well, let's start with the song. Let's start with the song as we begin today.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And for this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and their praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, O gracious God. Amen. Lord, we give thanks that you have found us in this space this morning. Hear our promises, Lord, and help us keep them in the midst of worship. Bless us as we go forward. Forgive us when we fail. And draw us close so that we become your people. Amen. You may be seated. We have, do we have a reader for today's lessons? Who? Oh, Hannah's the reader again. Hannah did such a nice job at 9.30, we, we decided to pay her twice. There we go. A reading from the book of Joshua. Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight. He protected us along the way that we went and among all the peoples through, the, through whom we had passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. The word of the Lord. Open your hymnals to 188 if you choose to see the music to this gospel acclamation. The gospel this morning is from St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. So this reading begins with the end of last week's teaching and then the reaction of the disciples after uh, this word of life, uh, bread of life teaching in the sixth chapter. So those who eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus taught, abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, 
not like that which your ancestors ate and then they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. And when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, the flesh that's useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe. And who was the one that would betray him. And he said, <clears throat> for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. So because of this, many of his disciples turned back and they no longer went about with Jesus. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> so, uh, when, I, when I do premaritals uh, with uh, young couples, um, like we just had with uh, Allison and Jared just this uh, past few months ago, I, I have them take this uh, computerized test uh, uh, by some big national company out of Minnesota. And, uh, and, and it's, it's like a compatibility sort of test, and it measures different things for your marriage uh, to be. And one of the things it measures is a marriage idealization, uh, which is the, uh, whether uh, how realistic you are as you begin this life together with this partner, you know. Um, uh, and, and so they ask questions uh, statements that you're either to agree with or disagree with and their and their statements like um i believe that my partner is the only one i could spend my entire life with or i believe that the that the passion uh that we have now will last our lifetime or or i believe that the conflicts that we have today will be better after we get married okay and the answer to all those questions according to the test is no <laughs> okay, your uh, conflicts don't tend to get better after they get married. In fact, sometimes they get amplified and magnified. And, and, and honestly, you could probably live with a multitude of different people if, if you kind of match up with them. Uh, and you're fortunate to find this one, of course. And, 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 and passion, you know, ebbs and flows in the midst of any married couple's lives. So, so the answer is no. Uh, and... My married couples that I'm a part of, they almost always answer yes to most of those questions. And so they, so they score low on marriage idealization. They're not realistic enough about their marriage. And, and, and I get the logic of the test. I mean, it, it, it's an understanding that, uh, that, that marriage isn't some cosmic sort of thing of two pieces coming together perfectly, you know, uh, like the romantic comedies that we love to watch uh, uh, would have us believe that, that marriage is a journey and it's work and it's effort and, and, and two people committed to, uh, to being together in the midst of the good and the bad and uh, um, learning how to not just love but how to fight and, and, and how to listen and, and, and how to forgive. And so that if you find somebody willing to live with you like that, it doesn't really matter whether it's Tom Hanks or Hugh Grant. You've got someone to go on this journey with you. And that's the logic of it. But, uh, but my couples, they, they, they almost always score low on marriage idealization. And, and that's not a bad thing in my mind, honestly. I, 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 I kind of want these married couples days before they're going to get married to be really excited and idealistic about what they're about to do. I mean... You know, you really don't want a pragmatic bride that goes, ah, Steve, he's not uh, too great in the passion department, and probably 20 years and 50 pounds aren't going to make that any better, right? That's not what you want to hear. Yeah, you, you want some eyes to be starry right before they make this. There, there's a lifetime that can dim 
those starry eyes. And <clears throat> so I don't pay much attention to it. But, but there is some logic there. And, and, and I was reminded of that when I saw this wedding ceremony that, that Hannah read for you. Because that's how that scripture set up. It's a, it's a wedding that happens at Shechem. And, and, and the bride is Israel. And, and the groom is God. And, and Joshua... The leader of Israel at this point, he's, he's the pastor. And he asks them right at the beginning, are, are you going to make this commitment? They do vows right there. Are you, are you going to love God and only God? And, and all the Israeli leaders that are in Shechem, they, they all say, yes, we do. And that's where our reading ends. But if you read the rest of it all the way through chapter 24, you would see that Joshua gives them two other times to change their mind. Right after 18, he says to them, now, are you sure about this? Because our God is a God that does not like when you betray him and love other gods. <laughs> well, you love only one God. And the people again go, yes, one God, that's us. Nailed it. And then he asks them a third time and he goes, okay, now if you love and say yes to this God, then you've got to say no to all the other gods of the Amorites and the Hittites and Egyptians, all those gods. And it might actually be better for you to say yes to those gods. Are you willing to say no to those gods and yes to only God? And the Israelites say again, yes, we are. And you can read the rest of the Old Testament to see how faithful they are to that yes. But I can, I can give you a Cliff Notes version it gets ugly, <laughs> okay? They, they do not keep their promises. Their marriage idealization is on high alert right there, and, and they've got some starry eyes. And I was reading someone who this week who said how naive the Israelites were at Shechem to think that they could live in the midst of all these gods and just love one God. And, and you know, and I push back, I go, we're all that naive in the midst of the promises that we make. We in the church should not be uh, casting aspersions on the Israelites because in worship, we make promises like that all the time. And, and when we do a baptism, when we gather around this font and I have my baptismal candidate, I have the congregation join in the questions. So as my candidates affirming their relationship with God, you are committing again to God. So I, I say to the candidate, do you reject sin? Congregation, do you reject sin? And, and everyone says, yes, we don't want any part of sin. Do you reject the devil and all his empty promises? And everyone says, yeah, we hate the devil. How about spiritual forces that would lead us against God? No spiritual force is going to get us against You guys are enthusiastic in the midst of that. As enthusiastic as Lutherans ever get in the midst of worship. Right? Inside, you're enthusiastic. And of course, you know, we know that, that we turn around and we, and we break those commitments. We're, we're in it in the moment, but it gets hard to keep these promises we make. So I'm in conversation with people that, you know, that tell me, this is the problem with organized religion. Why are you kind of setting people up to say stuff that they're never going to be able to keep anyways? Right? I, I mean, there's a lot of social pressure when we do these public confessions like we do in the church to, to say, yes, we renounce them. <laughs> I mean, I don't really give you a space to discuss it and to clarify it with me. And, and no one ever raises their hand and say, uh, Pastor, I can't reject all sin because my neighbor's got a really great Corvette that I covet. And I think that's a sin, right? Right? I mean, we don't have those kind of discussions. We just renounce them all together. And in the midst of worship, we encourage enthusiasm. So sometimes people have sort of an unfounded hopefulness in the midst of worship. Where, where they're hopeful that this time they can fight against the spiritual forces that keep them against God. And they're, and they're hoping that they're able to renounce those spiritual forces 
And let's say it's alcoholism, and then they go home, and the refrigerator's full of beer, and, they, and, and then they go to their job, which is a bartender, and then they got all their friends. Or, you know, they, there's nothing that's changed in that moment to help them in that fight, and, and yet they've renounced those spiritual forces that have them in their grips. And we never moderate any of these promises we make, right? And we, we, we don't revisit it and, uh, and, and say... <laughs> Wow, I think to death do your part just doesn't make sense now that we're living older. Let's just say five years in a marriage vow, and then we'll come back and we'll revisit it later and see how we're doing. We, we keep with these big promises. So people say, why do we do this at all? Why do we set people up to, uh, to fail, to, to show their brokenness? But we do, don't we? Over and over again, these public commitments, these public promises we make in worship to God in front of our neighbor, they seem important to us. I mean, 15 to 20 times a year, you'll make some sort of public commitment to God around baptism here at Messiah Lutheran Church. <laughs> It'll come up that often in the midst of worship because it's important for us to hear our neighbor and ourselves make these promises. <clears throat> Marriage continues to be important to us. Even, even people that have suffered uh, a broken marriage, a, a marriage that didn't work, uh, return to that altar again to, uh, to, to, to pledge vows again because it's important to make that commitment and promise. Even this marriage ritual in Joshua that we read, this thing that happened at Shechem, an identical ritual happened two other times in Scripture, hundreds of years after this one. Both times after Israel obviously failed at loving only one God. And they were moments of recommitment. And when they came together again, they didn't change the language. They didn't say, Whoa, we really screwed the pooch back there in Shechem. We, 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 we better move this around. No, it was the identical thing. Somehow, publicly, committing to something that is aspirational is, moves us closer to God. Even though we know we're broken and we're going to fail. So, one of the most important theologians of the Christian church in the 20th century is a man named Karl Barth, which many of you probably haven't heard of. But, but if you went to seminary like I did in the 20th century, you, you would have heard him because he's, <clears throat> he's who you teach. And Karl Barth <clears throat> was a, uh, a man from Switzerland, actually, but he, but he taught in Bonn, Germany. Uh, most of his career in the 1920s, in the 1930s, and the, into the 1940s. And, and he saw Germany start to coalesce around this leader, uh, a guy named Adolf Hitler, who you might have heard about before. And, and, and before the Nazi party took power, he was very vocal in letters to his friends about what he thought about Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Party. In one letter, he said that why is Germany following a man that is either incompetent or stupid? I don't know. And when Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Party, the Nazi Party, took power in 1933 by a democratic election, <clears throat> he was the keynote speaker a month later at a large Protestant gathering, a convocation that happened annually. And the Protestant church in Germany is a little different than the Protestant church in America. They have a, a confederation of all the different denominations uh, that move together as one church called the German Evangelical Church. And so this German Evangelical Church, which, could, which the local congregation could have a Baptist preacher or a Lutheran preacher or a Reformed preacher, but it's all the same church. A little crazy for us Americans to think about. But it's basically all the Protestants in Germany. And so he's the keynote preacher. And what does he preach on? He uses this scripture in Joshua. And he preaches about only worshiping one God. And in the midst of that sermon, he grieves that his German 
Brothers and sisters insist on following small gods, tin gods, little gods. They're going to constantly disappoint them. And everybody knew who he was talking about. And after that gathering of the German Evangelical Lutheran Church, <clears throat> Karl Barth was a leader along with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who you might have heard of too, uh, in creating something called the Confessing Church in Germany. And the Confessing Church was a, was a Protestant denomination that grew up in opposition to the National Socialist Party and in opposition to the German Evangelical Church. Because the German Evangelical Church had to make all sorts of concessions, just as the Roman Catholics did in Nazi Germany, in order to keep their doors open, in order to keep being church. And the Confessing Church refused to do this. And, and in the midst of this, as he was training up pastors along with Dietrich Bonhoeffer for this Confessing Church, they emphasized grace. They emphasized loving your neighbor. They emphasized God's love for marginal people. Just as the country was gathering up, not just Jews, although Jews primarily, but also uh, homosexuals and um, and, and people with mental illnesses or mental disabilities and, and, and fringe religions like Jehovah Witnesses and, and ethnic groups that were hated like gypsies. As these marginal groups were being kept up, the confessing church insisted on preaching God's grace that covers all of us. And the leaders of the confessing church were... Uh, were Pursued, arrested, tortured often, usually imprisoned, and sometimes killed. And here's the thing. By any standard of measurement, it failed. This confessing church was never a great percentage of the Christians in Germany. The far greater percentage were people that were part of the Roman Catholic Church and the German Evangelical Church. Those who carried out the atrocities that we talk about now uh, were by and large baptized children of God. And those who were in the confessing church and publicly made a statement out loud that there's a different way to be Christ-like in the world. They often recanted their public vows when their life was endangered or their family's life was endangered. The confessing church had little impact in Germany on the atrocities that were happening. If that's our measurement success, then they failed. But is it our measurement? Do we love a God that solely loves us if we're successful? I want to tell you that, that there's goodness in aspiring to be who God longs for you to be, even though that might be more difficult than we can imagine. That our amens aren't empty when we know that we're not going to be able to keep these promises, but they're hopeful that maybe this time I will be able to keep my promises. I want to tell you that, that there were people who were saved by Christians in Germany by Muslims in Germany, by atheists in Germany. And they were moved by the grace-filled witness of those in the confessing church who made themselves known. I want to tell you that the measure that God has for us is our trust. That even in our brokenness, God's love can be found. 
Because when we make promises aloud in front of each other, we are witnessing where we hope our heart will go. And that's no small matter. And our God is as starry-eyed in those moments as any couple I've ever married. Because our God is our parent and our loves us. And has hope that this will be who we can be. And our God loves us in the midst of our brokenness. Not just when we're fixed, but when we're at our greatest despair. We continue to make promises to God publicly in front of each other because it moves the needle of our faith. It sets a lodestar for us to sail to. It encourages us even as we get discouraged. Because we are confident that our God finds us, lifts us back up, and puts us back into this game of life. Keep your starry eyes. Because our God's got big plans for us. Amen. precious Savior, whom yet unseen we love. O name of might and favor, all other names above. We worship Thee, we bless Thee, to Thee alone we sing. Praise thee and confess thee, our holy Lord and King. O bringer of salvation, who wondrously hast wrought thyself the revelation of love beyond our thought. We worship Thee, we bless Thee, to Thee alone we sing. We praise Thee and confess Thee, our gracious Lord and King. In thee all fullness dwelleth, all grace and power divine, the glory that excelleth, O Son of God, is thine. We worship thee, we bless thee. Thank you.
perfect praises ring and evermore confess thee our Savior and our King. I want to ask you to join with me now no matter how much you have failed to keep these promises before to to embrace them again this morning, to move the needle of your life towards God, towards righteousness, towards help, hopeful living that delights not just yourself, but your neighbor's life, the creation, and our God. So I'm going to ask you to open your hymnals, those red books in front of you, and turn to page 234 at the front of the hymnal. Not hymn 234, but 234 at the front of the hymnal. And let us begin with prayer. Merciful God, we thank you for our brothers and sisters whom you have made your own by water and word and baptism. You have called all of us to yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished us in the community of the faith. Uphold your servants now in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom you have fed through this new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. So I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus. Reject sin and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? If so, say, I renounce them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? If so, say, I renounce them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that will draw you away from God? If so, say, I renounce them. And do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So you have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in this covenant that God has made with you to keep these promises that you have made in holy baptism and renewed today? The promise to live among God's faithful people in community, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through your words and through your deeds, to serve all people following the example that Jesus has set for all of us and to strive for justice and peace on our earth. If so, say, I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. I do, and I ask God to help and guide me. People of God, do you promise to support and pray for one another in your life in Christ? If so, say, we do, and we ask God to help and guide us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God, that through water and the Spirit you have given us new birth. Cleanse us from sin and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in your people the gift of your Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, the Spirit of joy in your presence, now and forever. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Holy God, we pray for all those of our brothers and sisters that are in need this morning. We pray for Kimberly Berry Ryan, Meg Reidler, Susan Franklin, Jennifer Soltz, Ralph Portier, Ryan Thomas, Jerry Amarat, Sherry Holton, Paul Blackburn, Brigida Whitman, Beth Bauman, Adam Lookup, Al Smith, Ann Graham, Evan Jones, Homer Berry, Jim Potter, we pray for Dennis and Karen and Lata. We lift up Karen McCarty. 
We pray for Lindora at the loss of her mother and for safe travels to Liberia as she celebrates her life of her mother and grandmother in Christ. And we give time now for other names to be said aloud. Hear all these prayers, God. Assure us of your love. Help us keep our promises this time. Forgive us in our brokenness when we fail. We pray with confidence in the name of Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love and God's peace with one another now. A good gift of offering this morning from uh, Hannah, who you heard read earlier today. Now you're going to get to hear us sing too. A good, a good gift. We're gonna. We don't take up offerings in the midst of this worship service, uh, but we, um, but we encourage you to share an offering if you have one to give. There's a bright shiny box out there uh, that you can put that in as you come and go this morning. Fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every? again just who I am because I need to know oh you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing you say I am strong when I think I am weak and you say I am held when I am falling short matters now is everything you think of me in you I find my worth in you I find my identity oh you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing you say when I think I am weak and you say I am held when I am falling short and when I don't belong oh you say I am yours and I believe oh I believe what you say of me I believe All I have and now I'm laying it at your feet. You will have every failure, God. You will have every victory. Oh, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak, and you say I am held when I am falling 
shore And when I don't belong Oh, you say I am yours And I believe Oh, I believe What you say of me I believe Oh, I believe Yes, I believe What you say of me I Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and the dreams of all, unite them with the prayers offer grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come the Lord be with you lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name, and we join in this unending hymn, and you'll find it on page 190 of your ELW hymnal, page 190 at the beginning, not hymn 190. Let us sing this uh, liturgy that's called the Sanctus. Lord, we uh, trust your promises that you've made to us to, to be here in the midst of the sharing of this wine and bread. And we know that we will be nourished by this meal so that we can keep the promises we've made to you, to love you and you alone. For Jesus made those promises to us on the night he was betrayed, where he took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he gave for all to drink, saying, this cup is a sign of the new covenant shed in my blood for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this wine, we are proclaiming the very mystery of faith that Christ has died, 
Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Find us this morning. Delight us with your presence and send us to be your people. A people of righteousness and justice and peace. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, <clears throat> but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing the Lamb of God on page 191. sin of the world. Have mercy on us, Lamb of God. You take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us, Lamb of God. You take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace, Grant us peace, Lamb of God. Communion together with these communion kits. If you can release that white wafer in the middle, hold up your wafer, we'll eat this together. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. Pull back. The foil. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Lord, fed and nourished by your body and blood, may we be your people now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for just a few brief announcements before we scatter and live out the promises we've made today. Uh, one is that daily I do prayer, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at 9 o'clock, uh, unless my life uh, gets crazy and, and I'm not able to do it or I can't uh, avoid because of appointments. Um, and I encourage you to be part of that. I, I live stream those prayers uh, at 9 o'clock. I don't have too many people that join me live streamed. Uh, a few of you do uh, that are here now. Uh, most people come in during the day and, and uh, see this posting and take a moment to read the scripture for the day, hear a short reflection that's two or three minutes, and then a prayer that's about the same length. The whole thing is usually anywhere from six to eight, nine minutes uh, on a morning. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a gift for me to pray with you, and, and I hope it's a gift for you to pray with your brothers and sisters. So if you do come to pray, I, I hope you, uh, you like it because that tells the other people that you were there and praying. I know a lot of people don't hit that like thing, but it, it, kind of, uh, it kind of helps us know who's praying with us that day. And if you have prayer concerns, I want you to put them on there. Uh, even though you're not live with me, I, I read them in the evening and then I lift them up in my evening prayers. And when others come during the day, they, they will lift them up in their prayers too. So, uh, so share your prayer concerns for that day on this. And finally, we are, we've been on the Facebook group page for this. And we're going to move it to the Facebook page starting on Monday. Uh, and that's simply because the algorithm on the group page pushes it down to the bottom in the morning. And it takes you people liking it to kind of move it up there. So I hear from you all the time that you can't find it. And that's why it gets kind of buried on that group page. Especially on days when we have a lot of things that we're posting or a week where we've had a lot of things posted. Whereas on the Facebook page, it'll just be the, the last thing posted is the first thing on the list. So it'll be really simple to find uh, when you go to that Facebook page. I will continue to share it to the group page um, and uh, uh, just to kind of help people who are searching around. And, and if none of this makes sense to you at all, don't ask me, okay? I mean, we, we can uh, 
Call Linda on Tuesday. She'll appreciate all those phone calls to find out. There we go. Um, anyways, yeah, it's a good community. We, we have anywhere from 20 to 30 people that usually pray with us every day. Uh, some who say, some who make themselves known and others who just tell me later that they never miss that. So we, we encourage that. Uh, we also want to announce that um, we're going to have a pet blessing next week at the 930 worship service outside. If you want to take part in that, hopefully we'll have a day as beautiful as today for this pet blessing outside. We want your pets that are uh, excited to be part of the community of Christ here at Messiah. So if you have a pet that is less than excited to be here, we probably don't want to bring them, okay? So just, just pets that are loving of their neighbors. Uh, God loves all pets, but we're only going to bless the ones that won't bite others, okay? And then the last thing is our, our, our grief group is meeting on Wednesday. We call it Holigan. They're going to meet out in the shelter house for lunch at 1130. Uh, they're buying subs for whoever comes. Uh, come and take part of that, uh, whether you're supporting others who are in grief, whether you're in the midst of grief yourself. Uh, be part of this good community and love each other in, in this ministry. So that's 1130 on Wednesday here at the shelter house. And on Wednesday morning, our senior saints are meeting at 10 o'clock for, um, for their choir. Um, and on Thursday, uh, our bell choir and then our, our, um, our, our, our sanctuary choir called Camerata. Camerata, did I get closer? <laughs> Sorry. Gosh, I'm such an idiot. They're, they're meeting on uh, Thursday night. And also, we have a new junior choir, too, which I forgot about. And, and they're meeting on Thursday nights, too. 5.30. So all that's in your bulletin on that bulletin board. Come, g give a good gift of song uh, for the congregation. You saw what uh, Good Work Hannah does to help just move us closer to God. So it's appreciated. Uh, with all that, we'll have our blessing, and then we'll scatter. Stand up. Can't be seated for a blessing, for goodness sakes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you all with favor and grant you God's peace. Amen. Now, I hear today is Miss Alicia's birthday. Is that right? It sure is. Oh, well, we, we can't let you get out of here without singing you out the door. <laughs> well, that too. Let's do it with organ then. <laughs> Thank Even to better. you.
Take care.